Clothing and dressing have been an essential part of everyday life since the beginning of time. Apart from the basic function of covering our bodies, clothing reflect different social classes and communicate cultural diversity. People dress to make statements, fashion statements. Welcome to Doing Business in Rwanda. In this episode, we bring you the sights and sounds from the Rwanda Fashion Week 2022, as well as conversations around sustainable fashion. I'm your host, Tessie Carvin. Glamour, color, creativity and diversity all came together beautifully at this year's Rwanda Fashion Week. The platform that promotes the Rwandan creative industry in fashion and modeling also attracted international attention with both designers and models from across the globe in attendance. Happening on the sidelines of the 26th Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting Chogam held in Kigali, Charles the Prince of Wales and Camilla the Duchess of Cornwall graced the Rwanda Fashion Week with their presence, making it even more glamorous. For various designers, the Fashion Week was a great platform to showcase their work. This is one of the biggest, um, I guess, events or week in our, you know, in our fashion calendar. And then also just being youth coinciding with uh, Choga, you know, to be able to have Prince Charles and um, Duchess. It was really, it was an honor. So really, it, it meant a lot to us. Yes. The Rwanda Fashion Week uh, means a lot for me because 10 years ago when I started, there was not such a thing. I used to be the one producing all my shows hiring model, do everything backstage, everything for myself. But now, this means when we are coming together, we have more opportunity, we have more uh, force, we can reach to many people and we can go beyond Rwanda. So it means more opportunity, it means more uh, uh, togetherness, it means also uh, the possibility also to grow our brand to another level. It means a lot to us because they're going to boost both sides, uh, first from the designers and second for the um, models and third for the, uh, our country in general because I, uh, this is going to also include the culture, entertainment, beauty, makeup, hair, style, everything. So it's a, a good opportunity for us as a Rwandan to show the world what we can. The Rwanda Fashion Week was appointed a member of the Commonwealth Fashion Council in London, opening up new opportunities for Rwandan creatives in the fashion industry. The nascent industry has made huge strides over the years. Um, the fashion scene in Rwanda has definitely grown. It's, it's always exciting to see new designers coming up. Um, when we started Collective, for example, we were just, I think, four brands, and today we're over more than 10. So it's just the, the progression and just seeing how the, the industry is growing, how, um, I guess, you know, a long time ago, fashion was seen more as tailoring, but now that it's actually a career, the fact that we're creating jobs, we are contributing to the Rwandan economy, all this really um, makes everything worthwhile. The growth journey was tough because I was one of the very first ones to start and uh, to be honest, when I see now 10, 12, 30 designers around Rwanda, I'm like, wow, I'm impressed. I really didn't know that it could go that fast, like within 10 years to have all these houses, all these brands coming up. Perfect. Wonderful. Wonderful. According to data from Euromonitor International, the combined apparel and footwear market in sub-Saharan Africa is estimated to be worth well over 31 billion US dollars. Despite the disruptions spelled by the COVID-19 pandemic, 2022 is broadly expected to be a year of growth, with total fashion industry sales estimated to surpass 2019 levels by 3 to 8 percent, according to the State of Fashion 2022 report by McKenzie and Company. However, some of the players in the industry say that the potential of the African fashion industry is yet to be fully realized. The African fashion industry has the least um, amount of um, global footprint with regards to the international fashion um, scene. Um, the, uh, the global fashion industry is worth, well, like you said previously, about $3 trillion, but African fashion brands contributes 
less than 1% to that figure. Um, and there's a massive disparity there because of the sheer size of the, the, the continent, its population size, and the fact that the African fashion industry actually hires the second highest number of people on the continent, only after agriculture. So we have the output, um, we have the capacity, but it doesn't necessarily translate to economic growth and economic prosperity. And um, keying into Nigeria, it's, I mean, it's, 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 the brands there are thriving in the sense of the country, but there's so much more potential that we could be harnessing, but we're not able to harness that, that potential because, of the, because there are severe issues across every single aspect of the value chain, and it is dire information to share, but there are solutions, and I think that we're here to discuss the solutions, and those solutions um, range from, well, for one, um, reducing the amount of uh, the amount of secondhand stock that's sent to Nigeria, I think that for one is something that could, to African countries in general, that's something that could massively improve um, our economic um, state and output. Um, and then you have other parts of the value chain, such as the trade aspect of the value chain, where investment and reforms could be um, implemented so that those, um, those processes are, are a little bit easier. The growth in the industry has, however, come with a downside. According to the United Nations Environment Program, the textile and fashion industry accounts for nearly 2 to 8 percent of global carbon emissions. The sector is ranked as the world's largest industry polluter after the oil sector. Focus has now shifted to sustainable fashion. There is a lot of conversation happening, which is exciting, um, moving towards the just transition, meaning that we would be moving away from business practices which are very exploitative, not only of people looking at social justice, but also looking at the environment and our finite resources. And as you said, and as the, as the film highlighted, we are overusing and overproducing at an exponential late rate. It's, it's not sustainable. And so to, to readdress that, we have to... It's, it's almost like reinventing the wheel because fashion has become this runaway train where um, the drops into shops, certainly in the UK and in, and, and in many countries in the global north, are so fast that the consumer is, over, is, is buying too much and the waste is ending up uh, proving uh, to, over, it's, it, it, we're, we're overproducing and then we're, over, we're m more wasteful than ever. So this whole system really needs a readdress and to get there, it's almost like you have to go back to basics and you have to really, really understand what, what a new vision would look like because if you just try to change parts of this, I don't think it's enough. It actually needs a real sea change. And what's exciting is that when you look at the EU with their EU textile strategy, the UK as well, we're all, they, these countries and also in, in America, they are looking at how they can take responsibility for the levels of waste. Players in the industry say it is not easy to practice sustainable fashion, especially because of the inavailability of raw materials. However, as Kenya George explains, a demand-driven business model in the fashion industry is more sustainable than the mass production model. I think we need to shift from fast fashion to more to, to slow fashion and to look more on on-demand rather than an inventory-driven model. For instance, on my last trip to to Thailand, I I experienced something that really gave me like a boost, it encouraged me in what I was doing locally. I went to a company that was manufacturing on demand and anything I wanted from their catalog I could have on that same day, on demand. And I walked into the store, everything was on display, I could feel the fabric, I ordered a beautiful silk dress, I ordered a jacket suit, and they said I will have it within 24 hours. I asked the gentleman, how is this possible? He said, we have a factory with 350 seamstresses waiting for your order. And as soon as you place that order, we, we split it and they manufacture it and it's ready for you within 24 hours. I had my two outfits within eight hours at my hotel. They came, did a fitting, and I was blown away. Now that is a better model for sustainability because it's demand driven. They don't have a, a, an inventory of 350 dresses waiting for someone to buy. They have 300 seamstresses waiting for you to come and tell them what you want. 
and they're kept busy all day. That store was busy all day. People came in and ordered what they want and got it within 24 hours. And we need to shift to a demand-driven model rather than an inventory model that ends up in the discount stores, second-hand stores, and then in the landfill because we just can't maintain it. Every year, according to the UN Statistics Division, millions of tons of used garments make their way to the African continent. This has posed a challenge to African countries who are struggling to establish their local textile industries. Rwanda has been deliberate to phase out second-hand clothing and build policies that will support the growth of the local industries. Rwanda got a lot of pushback when we talked about banning second-hand uh, clothing, which is supposed to be it's supposed to be phased out, really. Um, but the logic behind that is we have to build our own local garment industries. And how are we going to do that when we are competing with $2 clothes, $3 clothes, right? And keep in mind that what we are getting from, from these developed countries is bottom of the barrel, you know? Um, we do understand that, that second-hand clothing is, is considered sustainable fashion because, you know, it's circular fashion. Um, so in developed countries, it's something that's encouraged, you know, buy second-hand clothes. But what we get is, again, bottom of the barrel, and it prevents us from growing our own local industries because we cannot compete with those prices. Um, so obviously right now we are not ready to say no more second-hand clothes because we do not have um, the capacity to, to, to fill that gap. But I think that, that it's something that we are moving towards. We have the right policies in place. We have the Made in Rwanda policies. Um, we have policymakers that understand that we need to, to grow the fashion industry and to do it in a, in a sustainable way. So I think that's an important step. Um, yeah, so now it's really about doing the hard work and, you know, um, building the industries, and, 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 and a lot of training has to be done as well, um, strengthening our, our TVETs and, and uh, our cooperatives and all that, the people that actually produce um, the garments. Um, yes, but I think it's something that, 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 is, that is being strengthened right now. It's something that's being promoted. Um, Made in Rwanda is, you know, it's, it's becoming a lifestyle. It's something that a few years ago nobody wanted to wear Made in Rwanda. But, you know, today it's something that everybody is buying into. It's, it's more than just a trend, it's, it's a whole lifestyle. Um, so I think we have the right mindset um, and we have the right policies. So really what we're working on now is actually building and implementing those policies. The fashion industry in Africa is undoubtedly growing at a fast rate and with the right enabling environment, the sky is the limit. I think the conducive environment would be made of multiple elements. Uh, number one is finance. We need to have more access to finances for all those designers. I think distribution is another one. You know, they will have to be able to promote and distribute their product to clients. So once they have those two things, obviously from a creative standpoint, I think they're good. You know, they are very creative. They, they know how to do their thing. But it's for us to be able to put a, flat, a platform for them to be fully equipped you know, to shine. So that's what we need to do. Well, it's a wrap for this edition of Doing Business in Rwanda. Thank you so much for watching. We would love your feedback. Connect with us on Twitter. Our handle is at CNBC Africa or tag me directly at Tessie Carmen. Bye for now.